Let's go. Let's go, Houston. Yeah, not even my squad, but yeah. I mean, I might be saying I ain't fucking with the Redskins no more, but you know, you can't just not be a fan of a team overnight, you know what I mean? Like, put in too many years, too many, too many hours of hard work. Known as the Washington Redskins. Hell to them. By the time Michael was eight, he was turning the violence he experienced at home outward. He remembered capturing and killing birds himself, whacking them with sticks. Too much sun. Too much sun. Let's go. Too much sun. Second and two. Let's go. Soon he graduated to fist fights with other kids, then knife fights, then glue sniffing, and finally armed robbery. He went to reform school at the age of 12 and landed his first prison sentence at 18. It was after an escape that he murdered the store clerk. Michael and he, uh, Joe and his partner thought the man was going for a gun, but after they searched his slum body, they realized he was just reaching down to hand them the night deposit back. Only in the middle age did Joe have the, the wherewithal to ask, what the hell happened? He does not know what turned him from an innocent little kid into a young man who fired a bullet into another man's chest, he says. But it wasn't that I was naturally cold-blooded. You know, there's a good percentage of Southern whites who automatically see a black man, a black woman, and automatically believe that, that we're naturally cold blooded in our hearts. It's all good. Get up, get up, get up. Yeah. Yeah. That's all look good. That's all look good. You got hit up high. Get up, man. I can't see this on Watson easy another season, yo. I can't see that above on this another season. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I can't see him miss another season, yo. His name needs to get into that list that includes Doug Williams and Russell Wilson. And Charlie and Charlie Batch. Charlie Batch was on was on those squads. Good job. Good job, man. So good. I truly believe he is the next quarterback to enter that list. That special list. If y'all know which list I'm talking about, it has Doug Williams's name on it, and it has Russell Wilson's name on it, and Charlie Bash is on that list too. Was Byron left with with Pittsburgh when they won the Super Bowl? I can't be sure. Cam Newton went, didn't win. That's about it. Yeah.
Prisoners in Texas, as elsewhere, share a great many characteristics. They tend to be poor, poorly educated, and non-white. They also tend to be young, heedless, and angry, at least for the first few years behind bars. When you sit down and talk to inmates about their lives, however, you soon discover that what unites them most of all is pain. Pain that they have soaked up as victims and pain they have inflicted on others. Kimberly Leovelli, a recent parolee, epitomizes this dynamic. Though, like most women offenders, she has suffered more than harm. A middle-aged white woman with a corny sense of humor, Lavelle is tirelessly optimistic but with little cause. After serving 12 years for armed robbery, <coughs> after serving 12 years for armed robbery, she made parole on her fourth attempt in May 2005. With serious health problems, few marketable skills, and hundred dollars in discharge money, she moved into a trailer with her mother outside of Dallas. Kim, Kim's mom, Linda, had served time for bad checks, drugs, and prostitution. Her three siblings have also been in jail. One brother is still in prison, and one of her teenage daughters, whose childhood she largely missed just as her mother missed much of hers, was recently arrested for marijuana possession. When I talked to her shortly after her release, Livelle was exuberant. Freedom is strangely beautiful, new and exciting, she said. Still the challenges still the challenges of making ends meet and paying for medical treatment, all while teeth to an ankle bracelet, was always wearing her down. In December she lost her first job. Like many ex prisoners, Lavelle was, has made a lifetime's worth of bad decisions. She fell in love in junior high school and had a baby at the age of 15. Like her mother, she got into alcohol and drugs. In 1985, she, she shot a man she said was trying to rape her. Imagine if Christine Blasi had a gun with her that day. She, that Brett Kavanaugh tried to, you know, or imagine if she had a knife or if there was something heavy by the bedpost or something she could have smacked him with. He would have had his car that she would have pointed to. Now that would have been funny. Now that would have been funny as fuck, yo, because they just confirmed this motherfucker. Like, they just confirmed it. This motherfucker is on the Supreme Court. There's literally only three women on the Supreme Court right now, and they're the only liberals on the Supreme Court. You got Stephen Breyer who sometimes sides with the liberals but like <sighs> man I digress In 1985, she, she shot a man she said was trying to rape her. She left him for dead and got 10 years for attempted murder. Not long after she got out of prison in 1988, she and a girlfriend concocted a Thelma and Louise scheme to get Christmas presents for their kids. Borrowing a BB gun, Lavelle and her partner robbed eight stores in the Dallas Fort Worth areas before getting nabbed. Although the weapon was relatively harmless, the charge was armed robbery. After accepting a guilty plea suggested by her court-appointed attorney, Lavelle received, Lavelle received eight concurrent sentences, six of them for 50 years. Wow. Leavelle's recklessness led her straight to prisons, but given the arc of her life, I found it hard to imagine how she could have ended up anywhere else. Born in Dallas in 1964, Kimberly Leavelle spent her early years with her mother and her mother's second husband, a middle-class developer named Lloyd Wallace. During the first four years of my life, I had everything I want. I had everything a child wants. As she writes. I had my own room, nice clothes, a bike, and even had a maid. She was sweet as pie. 
Kimberly is fond of such sentimental sayings, almost as if to make up for a life devoid of tender sentiment. We were, quote, the family that looks perfect from the outside, she says. But on the inside, my mother was a caged human being. As the oldest of two brothers and, and a sister, Kim remembers the terrors of her suburban household more clearly than her siblings. Get, get, get his ass down, man. Tackle his ass. Oh, man. The hell can't you tackle that boy? He is hard to tackle, but still. Gausman is here to save the day, huh? As the oldest of two half brothers and a sister, Kim remembers the terrors of her suburban household more clearly than her siblings. Wallace was a tyrant. He became obsessive about Kim's mother, Linda, checking and rechecking her odometer and timing her excursions. Returning late from the grocery store one evening, Kim remembers that when her mother, who was pregnant with her baby brother at the time, made it up to the porch, Wallace, quote, stepped out and punched her so hard in the face that the groceries went flying, along with her mother. Then he locked them out. Another time, Leavelle was awakened by banging and scratching in the closet. When she mustered up the courage to investigate, she found her mother naked, tied up with cords from the blinds, Wallace has, has stumped her eyeglasses, cut up all her clothes, cut her hair off. Linda finally escaped with her children, but the family fled from, from abuse into the abyss. Kim remembers teetering over her brother's crib to give him a nighttime battle because her mother was walking late. She remembers standing in relief lines and going hungry. We all look dirty, she recalls. Not clean and pretty like we used to. My mom always had to walk. She cried a lot. One day, a distant aunt, a fat, sweaty, healthy voiced woman named Gladys, with a no, with a no accent husband, LD, in tow, came to fetch Kimberly. She didn't know it at the time, but she was being sent away because her mother was going to prison. Gladys and LD restored Kimberly to middle class comfort but at a price. She was too young to go to school when she first moved in, so LD used to watch her when Auntie Gladys went, went to work. <sighs> Them nasty ass uncles, yo. Them nasty ass uncles, like this, <sighs> man, yo. Hey. Just in case some white racist fucker decide to take my life because of what I'm doing here, or some ethnic self-hating ignorant black man or woman decides to want to take somebody's advice and money and want to take my life, that's why I'm offering little bits and pieces of, of fatherly advice to a daughter I haven't been a father to yet, I haven't had the opportunity to be a father to yet. Geneva, please, I'm begging you, listen to everything your mother tells you about boys, okay? Men, we are some shit. We are pieces of shit all the way, your father included. Your father is not that big of a piece of shit because your father has respect for what it means to be a woman in this, in this male-dominated society that we have lived in for millennia, you know what I mean? But at the same time, though, remember one thing. You cannot spell manners without spelling man. You might get into a phase where you want the bad boys and all that. Even true real, real bad boys that real women go for have manners when it comes to situations where you're supposed to have manners. Not just for women, for, for, for men and women alike. But manners take you a long way. You cannot spell manners, M-A-N-N-E-R-S, without spelling man, M-A-N always try to look for that that attribute in whatever boy you might like you know what i mean I, i'm 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 just saying this hopefully i get the opportunity to 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 be there and deal with 
situational issues as they arise as you do grow old and become a young lady and become a young woman and become a full grown woman I do hope I am dead to do it but just in case I am not you cannot spell manners without spelling man and that bad boy, that bad boy things is only cute to you to you like 13 and 14 after that by the time you're 15 and 16 you realize that bad boy shit is out of the window anyway unless you're a white Republican in America, you know, then they are raping bad boy things, it's a forever thing, you know. But yeah, I just had to say that. And also, you catch more bees with honey. I know you, you, you might possess that your father's stubbornness and your father's little bit of stuttering temper, but you know, your father also knows that you catch more bees, bees with honey, you know. I just had to hit on that because, you know, they just, they just not put a verifiable basis on the Supreme Court. Let's go. One boy. Let's go. Got that, got that. Ah. Gladys and El Dio restored Kimberly to middle class comforts, but at a price. She was too young to go to school when she first moved in. So El Dio used to watch her when and Gladys went to work. She also used to take off her clothes for washing with unusual regularity. Kimberly was only four years old when it, when it started. But she was sharing, she was sharing flashes of memory. Sweating and reeking of beer. Y'all know how Brett Kavanaugh said he liked drinking beer. Like, this rapist always liked drinking beer, yo. And it's probably always Bud Light or, or Michelob or some shit. Or MGD or some shit. I don't know. It's probably it's always some Budweiser, some Coors Light, some shit. Some... Some redneck beer raping ass motherfuckers. I'm sorry, yeah, man. I, I, I just, I, I just can't. <sighs> they be making me feel like Detective Order Finn Tutuola over here, real quick. No BS. Sweating and reeking of beer, LD would have Kimberly sit on his lap and put his and put her hand on his penis. Before long, as she, as she disengaged from the wall, Kimberly says that 
Kimberly says that she, she forged a desperate friendship with a glorious set of green and gold curtains with tassels that hung by the living room window. LD perched her on a stool in front of the curtains. I was wearing nothing but my black patent leather shoes and my wife frilly socks, she recalls. He picked out through the drapes from time, from time to time and told his special little girl not, not to cry. Then he raped her. I clung to those curtains with little white knuckles, she says. I looked down and I remembered that blood was on my legs and my pretty white socks and on my shoes. Afterwards, she explains, she becomes just, she, she becomes just like those curtains, ugly, no feeling, just hanging there. When Gladys found out that her husband could, could, could no better control himself with, with Kim than he had with his own daughter. See, all right, okay, all right, all right, time out. Any woman out there right now in the world who is in, in that position, Gladys is right now. Please, if you know this man got a problem with, 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 with putting his hands on women and little girls, especially little girls is not supposed to, what the, hell, the fuck are you still with him? Come on now. Like, what, as a woman, why would you, you know what, I don't know. Like, that's me trying to venture into things I don't know about. That's me trying to venture into the Yaya sisterhood, you know what I mean? But, but I just don't get that part of it, you know what I mean? I know somebody recently who, who always says that the women don't have a choice in that matter. But actually, yes, when, you know what? I'm just saying, ladies, if you know a, a man got a problem, if you know a man is like LD who got a problem like that, and you know for a fact, even if it's, you know for a fact he got a problem like that, come on, yo, don't. I don't know, man, so I'm going to stop, yo. So I'm a, I'm a wooser. That's just. When Gladys found out that her husband could no better control himself with Kim than he had with his own daughter, who, had, who has been in and out of mental hospitals as an adult, she passed this little girl on to different relatives. But deliverance from LD did not spare Kim for the trauma. Two other men molested her as she bounced from house to house. After her, her, her mother's release from prison, the family got a second chance. Linda signed up for welfare and started nursing school. But when the bills exceeded her income, she started selling prescription diet pills on the side. Chaos ensued. Over the next few years, they moved frequently. That's a flag. Where is the flag at? He didn't even turn his head around. Come on, Deshaun. Chaos ensued. Over the next few years, they moved frequently. At a party one night, Kimberly witnessed her uncle 
Ray Jr. shoot himself in the head. Not long after, when she was 12, she found out that her biological father had been murdered. Kimberly became a survivor. She got into some trouble at school but made drill team and the cheerleading squad. Other parents chipped in to buy the uniform. She stayed with friends as often as she could. As soon as she was able, she moved in with her first boyfriend, Rudy, and his mother. A cleaning lady with eight kids of her own. The winter before she turned 16, Kim got pregnant. But they hit the line though, didn't it? I was just overwhelmed when they brought my baby to me she because of her daughter's birth. I took everything off to make sure all the parts were there. She and Rudy walked she and Rudy both both worked minimum job and made a go at it as parents. They stayed with Linda, then with Rudy's mom. They struggled to make ends meet. But for but fraud, petty theft and drugs beckoned. Yo, you should not have taken that hit, kid. You should not have taken that hit, kid. Ah, oh, what a hit. You should not have taken that hit. You should not have taken that hit, kid. Not taking that hit. Both sides of the They struggled to make ends meet, but fraud, petty theft, and drugs beckoned. Familiar ways to boost lousy paychecks. I haven't done that yet. Man, those are really familiar ways to boost one paycheck where you live in the law of wrongs of society. The discipline to fight those urges, though, to boost your paychecks in those forms is, is one of great of great import you know what i mean like it, it is some it takes some discipline y'all because it's rough that paycheck to paycheck shit ain't no joke shit ain't funny at all you know what i mean shit ain't funny at all just after her toddler turned turn three kimberly first went to jail for forgery and credit card abuse Little Cambry was one year younger than Kimberly had been when her own mother had been sent away. The cycle continued. Leavelli's journey into lawbreaking followed the same road map as tens of thousands of other women living behind bars. There is nothing spectacular about my life, Kim wrote from the Manton View unit in Gatesville about a year before her release. My life reads like any other female in, in an institution. Physical and sexual abuse, trauma, poverty. We're a product of our environment. Indeed, repeated studies have shown that women prisoners, even more than men, follow grueling pathways into prison. Although women are six times less likely than men to have committed crimes of violence, they are more than three times as likely to have been violently victimized as children or adults. 57% of women versus 16% of men. According to researchers at Sam Houston State, 
Roughly a fourth of female offenders in Texas report that as children they lacked basic shelter, food, or physical safety. As in Leovel's case, most female prisoners in Texas have wrestled with poverty and substance abuse. Forty percent report that they were unemployed at the time of their arrest. Less than a third graduated from high school. More than half of women inmates report abusing alcohol or other drugs, with 40% admitting that they were using at the time they committed their offense. For most of American history, relatively few women went to prison, but that has changed dramatically with the escalation of the drug war, which now accounts for nearly 40% of all female felony convictions. Largely because the likelihood of imprisonment has increased most intensively among defendants convicted of low-level non-violent crimes, seriously violent felons were already being locked up under the old rules. The incarceration rate for women have increased more drastically, more dramatically than for men. Since 1980, the male imprisonment rate has tripled, but it has sextupled for women. The result is that the United States now incarcerates more than 215,000 women, which is greater than the total U.S. prison population, including both women and men. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Joe Flacco just hit a home run. The result is that the United States now incarcerates more than 215,000 women, which is greater than the total U.S. prison population, including both women and men before 1961. Wow. What happened, yo? It is not possible. That before 1961, the total population of the U.S. prison system was 200. It was less than 215,000. It was less than 215,000 before, between before 61, and now it's at 2.4 million. It's not possible that all those minorities of believe. Nearly two-thirds of these women are African-American or Latina, and more than 90% have been convicted of non-violent offenses. Duh. Although women tend to draw shorter sentences than men, the rapid expansion of female imprisonment has had a disproportionate impact on the free world, as prisoners sometimes call the rest of society. More than 11,000 female offenders go to prison in Texas each year, with a somewhat smaller number being discharged. As with Kim Leavell and her mother, most of these women, 64%, leave at least one dependent child behind. At least, that's a lot of kids left without mothers, yeah. And those kids grow up to end up. At least 10% of these children end up in foster care. Children of incarcerated women are among society's most vulnerable citizens and are the hidden victims of the expansion of the penal state, as asserts Beth E. Ritchie, a criminal justice and women's studies professor at the University of Illinois. Their lives are destabilized and their, materials and their material needs go unmet. Discharge women prisoners who manage to reunite with their children face another set of challenges. According to a 2004 study released by the Urban Institute, the vast majority of released prisoners in Texas make their way back to the roughest neighborhoods, places like Cadillac Heights in Dallas, 
or the third world in Houston, where poverty, joblessness, broken households, drugs, and crime make up the fabric of everyday life. Most of these women are single mothers who had difficulty maintaining stable households, and their prospects only diminish after being released from prison. They have accrued stigma, but not skills. Because so many released offenders have been convicted of drug crimes, they are subject to federal bans on, on public housing, welfare, and other social services. During the 1990s alone, 4,700 women in Texas were barred for life from food stamps, thus making it even more difficult for ex-offenders to provide basic sustenance for their families. Unsurprisingly, many of their children, like Kim and her siblings, start getting into trouble themselves once they hit adolescence. Incarceration today is a family matter, says a researcher at the National Council on Crime and Delinquency. There is an entire kinship system that is now moving through jail, prison, probation, and parole. They never lie about that. This was in 2010, yeah. It's only getting worse. It's only getting worse, yeah. Houston strong. Corrosive cycles of poverty, child neglect, crime, and imprisonment are defining features of correctional populations. Women prisoners tend to be more open about the connections between their childhoods and, and criminal careers, but most male inmates have tragic stories as well. Justice Department surveys show that one in three men in jail grew up with a parent or guardian who abused alcohol or other drug, drugs. One in two has a family member who has been incarcerated, and one in nine has had been taken away from his parents by the state. As with women prisoners, Male inmates tend to come from as much trouble as they have caused. Kenneth Broussard has seen a good deal of trouble. A skinny African American man with a bulky head, mural sized tattoos, and a youthful smile, he is serving 31 years for armed robbery. In another institution since he was a teenager, Broussard is proud of his tough convict reputation and makes a point never to, to display weakness. I'm a very strong-willed person, he writes in the letter. I'm not a troublemaker. I just don't take shit off no one, not even God. Young, intelligent, and angry with a long list of criminal convictions, Broussard is the type of offender corrections officers worry about. Held at the micro unit, one of the meanest lockups in the Texas system, he has regularly classed with white guards on his cell block. Yet Broussard not only creates mayhem on occasion, he is its product. That's gone. That's gone. That's out of here, Tiger. That's gone. That's gone. Dave Roberts, second black manager to win a World Series. Let's go. Dave Roberts, hope we have more, you know. I mean, he wouldn't just be the first African American, he would be the first Asian American as well. Of Japanese descendants, I think. But I could be wrong though, I digress.
Come on, Manny. Manny about to give him the lead. You didn't walk him. You didn't walk him. He about to give him the lead. They don't walk him, he about to give him the lead. If they don't walk him, he about to give him the lead. Damn, what a fucking play. What a fucking play. What a play. Born in the port city of Beaumont in 1972, Ken started out his life in a downwardly mobile neighborhood defined by white flight and concentrated poverty. In a florid autobiographical essay he penned for a prison writing class, he explained that he was raised among prostitutes who stank with the odors of their trade, among pimps with big hats, flashy jewelry, and cheap cologne, and on cracked streets littered with broken bottles, trash, winos, and occasional overdose junkies. Ken's mother, Brenda, a simple country girl, girl with jet black wavy hair and olive skin, had Ken when she was 16. She was hooked on heroin and cocaine at the time and already had a two-year-old at home. Ken described his father, Jesse, as a very abusive man, a drunk, a dope fiend, and a pimp. Each of his parents have spent more than a decade in prison. Between them, they have 12 children, but only Ken and his little brother, Jerry, share the same mother and father. Not long after Jerry was born, Ken's, Ken's mother left Jesse for a new man who turned out to be even meaner than the boy's father. Echoing a familiar prison story, Ken says that one of his early, earliest memories is of his mother being hit. Paul used to beat my mother senseless when he was drunk, he remembers. I once tried hitting him with a broomstick, but he just backhanded me across the room. Trying to tell you, Sean Lee is a beast. He remind me of Brian Orlaka. Just with a smaller frame. Sean Lee is a beast, yo. Come on. Better not lose to Dallas, yeah? Come on. Better not lose to Dallas, yo. Come on, man.
The football guys are with the fucking cowboys, yo. They're with these, they're with these fucking cowboys. Let me see who, what this defense is going to do real quick. Good trip, good trip, good trip, good trip. When Ken was about nine years old, his mother snuck away and made for California. With her five kids crammed into an Oldsmobile Delta 88, she set off on, on, on Interstate 10 with high hopes for, of a better life. From the stories Mama told me, we thought California was a promised land. Ken chuckled. Ken chuckles. We thought California was a promised land, Ken chuckles. As for so many California dreamers, however, the road proved bumpier than expected. The family ran out of money before making it across the arid expanse of West Texas. Mama wrote bad checks for gas, he says, and when she ran out of checks, we hit truck stops so she could sell her body for food, for gas and food money. It was winter time, so the kids froze while while their mother hustled. That was the first time I got drunk, Ken remembers. Mother gave us some vodka to cut, to cut the chill. Brenda had a sister in Los Angeles, but South Central during the crack wars turned out to be as unforgiving as Beaumont. The Delta 88 was stolen on the family's first day in the city, and Ken's mother got raped walking home from her new job at the store. Mama went into a funk after that, he says. She would sit staring blankly into space. Soon, she was, quote, hanging out with a shady bunch and shooting dope. To support her drug habit, she started turning tricks in the apartment, making the kids wait in the living room while she shot up and conducted her business. Every week, we had a new, quote, stepdaddy. Ken remarked acidly. <coughs> Even with the extra income, the kids when went hungry. Mama was gone for days at a time, he says. So I would mix flour and water and make, quote, pancakes. Kent's aunt finally scrapped together enough money to ship the whole crew back to Texas. But geography wasn't the problem. Brenda was soon back on the streets. Ken and his four siblings lived with her parents. But before long, Ken and Jerry got turned out. We were bad, he admits. With nowhere else to go, Brenda finally drove. Brenda finally drove the two boys to their pre, to, to their paternal grandparents' house on the Louisiana border. She dragged them to the entrance, pounded on the door, and when no one answered, gave them five dollars apiece. Mama said she was going to make a quick trip to the store, but she never came back. A few hours later, the grandmother they hardly knew came home. She saw two dirty kids on her front porch and actually tried to shoot them, shoo us away. He writes. Once they told her their story, once they told her their story, she took them in and tried to reconcile herself to raising the two wild. So raising the two wild wounded boys. 
never much of a parent herself, the woman didn't do much better as her grandparents. She was an alcoholic like the boy's father and mean with a switch. Her man, Matthew Hawkins, hung around the house and tried to have his way with the boys. He would wait until my grandmother was in a drunken stupor, Ken reports, and then creep into our bedroom and fondle our genitals and try to penetrate our rectum with his finger while holding his hand over our mouths to keep us from screaming. The boys fought back, once adding rat poison to, to, his, to his coffee, but their grandmother never believed their pleas. Every time we told, we got our asses beat. Yo, speaking of poison, right? I know these boys was escaping from a... Uh, for what were fighting of... Uh, uh, a rapist, a grandfather, the figure, you know what I mean, but still, I'm trying to see 60 minutes, I don't know now what it's about tonight, but, damn, this motherfucking score, how the hell you seen that shit is full score, yo, it's okay, speaking of rap poison, right, You probably gonna hear his name, you probably gonna see him. My uncle, your grand uncle, Mama Duruli, that lives, that last lived in Balange, in uh, at the village where your grandfather is from, my father is from, that last, he has a son named Abdul, right? They might tell you he's your uncle, call him uncle. I, I get it, give him the respect he deserves, but really don't because. That boy literally, that boy literally at the age of 14, 15, back in 2013, you know what I mean? Quite literally, that boy literally was poisoning your grandfather for maybe, for what could possibly be months at a time by taking batteries. Those batteries you guys have in Freetown that has all that, that black, acidic, toxic, tarish, black substance on the inside. He was literally breaking that apart and taking that and sprinkling it in your grandfather's food for what could have probably been months at a time. You know what I mean? I'm just saying, like, that was just wrong. Thank God I was in Freetown when we found out that was happening. When I say I would that boy's ass at night, I still got that belt. The belt I got, I still got that belt. This thing right here, this thing right here, no joke. North Dakota, and Susan Collins, Republican of Maine, sat down with us to explain their view of Judge Kavanaugh and why they this thing right here. against their own political interests. But yeah, watch out for him. Are you going to know who I'm talking about? Watch out for him. against me and family members and staffers 
Hey, CBS and the producers of 60 Minutes and all that good stuff, thank you for having Oprah on 60 Minutes, y'all. That is... I, I, know you, I know you guys appreciate her being there too because I can just feel her inputs in how pieces like this are put together with a woman's touch. Even though she might not be the producer, but at the same time, I know that collegial input was probably seeked from Oprah Winfrey as long as she's, she's available. Just, if I could pick Oprah's brain, I would too. You know what I mean? I'm just, Having a vote on laws that became that becomes laws of the land. You're saying there's never been a case where you drank so much. I said no, no. Remember what happened? That's it, no, no, man. Like you're asking about yeah, blackout. I don't know. Have you? Could you answer the question, Judge? It just so.
out. A website went up over these last couple of weeks. Collecting funds for whoever your opponent may be in 2020. And the deal was that if you voted for Kavanaugh, that the credit card pledges would be processed. If you voted against Kavanaugh, they wouldn't process the credit card numbers, and something over $2 million was raised. This is a classic quid pro quo as defined in our bribery laws. They are asking me to perform an official act, and if I do not do what they want, $2 million plus dollars is going to go to my opponent. I think that if our politics has come to the point where people are trying to buy votes and buy positions, that we are in a very sad place. Collins doesn't face re-election. Politics has always been there, though. Camp situation it's just you, the individual, have to choose not to re-election now. Not to and utilize Jones, such Judge means. Judge Kavanaugh's support in North Dakota was running 60%. At this moment, about four weeks before the election, you are running behind your Republican challenger in North Dakota. A political consultant would have told you that voting for Kavanaugh would have been better for you. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt about that. I think that the, the politically expedient vote here was a, a yes vote. Why not that? Because this isn't about politics. This is about a lifetime appointment on the Supreme Court. This is about... Uh, responsibility that we have as leaders, a responsibility that we have to exercise the judgment that we were sent here to exercise. I have too much respect for the institution of the Supreme Court, and I'm not going to be the person who uh, makes a decision. I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you, man. Make the decision based on yeah, the never lie. The <sighs> you did not want to be on that part of history, or that side of history. When 30 years from now, Kavanaugh makes it, has the decided vote, has the decided vote on a law that, yeah, I don't know what it's going to be, but I know he's not a good human being. With him, it's not about white or black or pink or orange or brown or yellow, you know what I mean? It doesn't matter. He's not a good human being. He's a rapist. Any man who has rapist tendencies is not a good human being. That dominance you feel like you have over women is not. Many of your opponents nah. are going to say she's she is pro choice, she is pro women's rights, and she just sent a man accused of sexual assault to the Supreme Court of the United States. I would never vote for someone who had committed sexual assault or who had lied about sexual assault. That's not a hard call for me. I would have voted no if I disbelieved uh, Judge Kavanaugh. But given his denials and the lack of evidence that this happened, I just did not think that it was fair to ruin. There wasn't the any evidence this, collected, this lady. Come on. His family. I'm not going to disrespect you because, yeah, that that's not who I am, but still. There are many who believe that Judge Kavanaugh will be the vote that results in abortion becoming illegal in the United States, and I wonder if you're concerned about that. I could not vote for a judge who had demonstrated hostility to Roe v. Wade because it would indicate a lack of respect for precedent. What Judge Kavanaugh told me, and he's the first Supreme Court nominee that I've interviewed out of six who has told me this, is that he views precedent not just as a legal doctrine, but as rooted in our Constitution. On this vote, the ayes are 50, the nays are 48. Please don't let this man become president, yeah. If you black and brown in America, especially if you black and brown in America, yo, please go out and vote. If you can register and vote, you have like less than you have less than 30 days left, yo. Please register and vote. You can do it online now. You can do it on your phone right now. You can stop listening to my dumb African ass right now and go like 
open up a new tab on your so your browser and go vote yo so mike pence would not be in a position to replace trump in the case of an impeachment or be in a position to run on their agenda with a packed congress leading into 2019 and 2020. it matters if you want black lives to really really matter like yeah, get people out to go vote and when you go vote i can't tell you who to vote for but i can tell you not to vote republican And if you think I'm, I am democratic trolling to get democratic votes, that's not my basis. My basis, I can't trust both parties because both parties are dominated by white folks. I'm just saying. I fear moderates more than I fear the extremists. Yes, because I already know where the extremists are coming from. You know what I mean? My man, Dr. King, helped me understand it a lot more and I've seen it in my everyday lives, you know what I mean? So, but long story short though, my point is this. Think about it, think about this, right? Just for a second, like if, if you've already registered to vote already and so you're back to listening to me, okay, fine, I appreciate it. Please subscribe. Somebody just told me the other day that if I'm gonna do this, I should ask people to subscribe because that's how YouTube measures status or significance or something so the, it would be better if i if more people subscribe than just people watching it so i guess that does make sense but please subscribe but my point is though that think about this for a second right the two main political parties in the united states republican and democratic right if donald trump really wanted to make really wanted to make America great so-called without having to do with the with the undertoned racial bigoted prejudice uh, undertones of the Republican Party of the GOP party of the Grand Ole Opry of the Grand Ole Party and all that extra bullshit that they come along with the party of the former Confederacy you know what I mean I can't even say former Confederacy now it's just like a quasi-confederacy that elected Trump, 62 million strong. But my point is this, the man could have ran as an independent and said everything he said and become president. But then Republicans wouldn't have voted for him because he would have been an independent candidate, right? So he had two choices, either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. He could have easily came out and said, he could have came out and ran as a Democrat, like he, like he had claimed to be in the 90s. He could have came out and ran on the Democratic ticket, right? He could have ran on that ticket and said the same things he said. And maybe still became president. But he couldn't have. Because even though there was still internal backlash towards internal negative feelings towards the Obama presidency, that he would have pointed out even though he was running on the Democratic ticket, you know what I mean? He could have gone up against Hillary in the primaries on the Democratic side of things, you know what I mean? That's my point, he could have. But he, instead he chose the one party he knew enough was rooted in enough racism to be his springboard into what eventually happened, you know what I mean? That shit matters, yeah. Like, for every black and brown person in America in 2015 and 2016, who thought to themselves, who said, who consciously came out of their mouth and said, I ain't going to vote, I don't trust neither one of them. And then when somebody points out to them that, oh, if you don't vote for Hillary, though, that means that you're against everything Obama has been about, it. Then, then all of a sudden you start thinking in your head, Obama ain't this shit for us anyway. As soon as, as soon as that line of thought has been processed in your head, once, once that seed has been incepted, that's it. You've seen the movie Inception. Thank you, Leo. But I'm just saying, once that seed has been incepted, that's it. If we don't break, if we don't get that seed out right now and sow a new seed that will get us into really, really going out there and actually get out and voting this year against anything that is Republican, we will come to regret that shit down the line, yo. We will talk. I can't tell you who to vote for, but I can tell you, do not vote Republican.
the racist piggery that is the Republican Party has been exposed. It has always been exposed. It has always been exposed. But now the, the proverbial proof is in the Trumpian pudding. Orange flavored. Like, you can't deny that shit now. You know what I mean? Like, forget all that little extra Illuminati shit. This shit is set up. Forget all that little extra noise. Forget all that noise. Those niggling little noisy little aspects that's out there. Forget all of that shit. Just pick up a book and read. And while you do that, once a year, maybe twice, if you want to go vote in the primary, you should go vote in the primary, you know what I mean? Because you will want to know who you're going to vote for in November. But once or twice a year, for maybe 14 hours, maybe 16 hours total that you might have to give up combined a year. Don't let me get out my calculator, tell you exactly how many hours in a year, you know what I mean? Because you just got to multiply. Yeah, I'm just saying. But for like maybe 16, 20 hours in a year's time, you go vote. That's it. And 30 minutes a day, you pick up something and read. That 30 minutes will turn into more as time goes on. It's a good habit. It doesn't cost nothing. It's a good habit. Put those phones down, man. If you want to stop listening to me, stop. I'm just saying. We are the Vlog Brothers on in 2007, the early days of youth, John Green and his kid brother Hank began sharing a way to stay in touch with each other. Good morning, Hank. It's Tuesday. In short order, and in lockstep with the growth of YouTube, the Green's videos amassed a huge... Uh, so I'm going to leave Texas stuff alone for a second. Uh, I feel like I should delve, I should go back to Ashley Montague real quick. Let me see what my British brother from another generation, from another mother was talking about real quick. If you haven't been keeping up with the past few seasons that's been going on in this 2068 a Negro Odyssey, if you haven't been keeping up, I had just finished with chapter one, the natural superiority of women, and I was getting to chapter two, the, sub the subjection of women. But before I start chapter two, let me reread the last line of chapter one, because it was awesome. It says, the liberation of a woman means the liberation of man. That is so true. Yo, Deshaun Jackson took a two minute hit, so.
was bad. It wasn't going to work. <laughs> the relationship wasn't going to work. The relationship wasn't going to work. Not the book wasn't going to work. No, no, no. The book might have worked or not, but I couldn't be dishonest um, about about that. Um, and if I didn't like it, sorry. I mean, I'm super glad I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> I don't think I could handle that pressure. Unfiltered criticism. Yeah, yeah. I like that, unfiltered criticism. I'm full of un unfiltered criticism, so if you're coming at me, now you better I'll be ready for it. I'm just saying, man. Everybody's got an opinion, and everybody swear their opinion is some shit, because they, they saw a racist feel video on Fox News, or on Breitbart, or Infowars. Get the fuck out of here. Nerds are the wall, you're nice. Nice. Being nerdy is really about how you approach what you love. Unabashedly, yeah. All five of you proud, unapologetic nerds. Being a nerd is cool as fuck. I swear, yo. I grew up a nerd ish person in high school. I don't want to admit I was a nerd, but that's why I said nerdish, but I think it, I, I can admit I was. I was part of it then, I didn't think it was that bad then, but see, you know, but at the same time though, it was more a problem of assimilation with me than just a problem of having an issue with nerdiness. It's cool, you know a lot of shit, it's awesome, you see things in a different way than the people who are not nerds. That would mean you're smart, and I think you're that smart to be considered a nerd. So, Jeba, don't feel bad. They're gonna call you bookworm all they want. So they say you, you get sense person, I don't know what that matter. And you find person, I don't know what matter. But you get sense person, I don't matter. Hi there, my name is John Green. This is Crash Course. Sorry, America. I just said something in Quill real quick. Yeah, I feel like I feel go to my job to the big field where it's like all Hispanics that work there and one Asian guy named David. Like this for the typical Asian American guy name. A guy born and raised in America, like American to the bone, but everybody just assume he's an immigrant because for the simple fact that he's Asian. Chapter 2, The Subjection of Women Why is it that in the most of the cultures of which we have any knowledge, Women are considered to be a sort of lower being. A creature human enough, but not quite so human as the male. Certainly not as wise, not as intelligent, and lacking in most of the capacities and abilities for which the male is so plentifully endowed. 
How has it come about that women have occupied a position of subjection to men in almost all the cultures of which we have any knowledge? Mankind is about a million years old, so is womankind. Since we know practically nothing directly about the social life of our early ancestors, the following discussions must, to a larger extent, be conjectural. But if, with all the necessary qualifications of caution, we were to judge from what we know of the social life of existing non-literate, often miscalled primitive people, we should have to conclude that for the greater part of the last million years, men have on the whole been dictatorial, unfair, and quite unkind to women. During this long period of subjection, women have been treated as chattel, slaves, housekeepers, economic advantages, and sexual conveniences. Throughout a great, great part of the world, they are still so treated. How did this relationship become, how did this relationship between the sexes come about? There are certain biological facts which are of pertinence. Here I should say not the biological fact as much as the interpretation which have made them, which have been made of them. Because women bear children and nurse them, they are forced to, to be much more sedimentary than men. Women is the cricket on the hearth. Woman is a cricket on the hearth, man is the eagle on the wing. Women stay at home to nurse and care for their children, to prepare food. Men leave the hearth for the hunt. It is necessary to understand that throughout, throughout nine-tenth of the long history of mankind, his economy was characterized by food, gathering, and hunting. Agriculture and herding of animals were unknown. Habitation, habitations were caves or the most kinds of windbreaks, similar no doubt to those built by the Australian Aborigine of the present day. Tools were mostly of stone and implements were of the simplest kind and few. Spears, hand hammers, choppers, grading and cutting tools of stone had been invented, as well as a fair number of other implements useful in the chase and for domestic purposes. But such equipment did not make hunting easy. Women could see their hand implements, could use their hand implements for the digging of tubers and other root plants. But men required weapons that would travel some distance to reach and slay the hunted animal. Often a man will have to travel many miles in order to secure his prey. Sometimes he, he might be away for days, even weeks. His mate generally remained on home grounds. Now, step by step, let us consider the consequences of the different roles played by each of the sexes. Roles arising from the fundamental biological sexual differences relating to reproduction, always resembling, always remembering that we are discussing the roles of the sexes during the long phase of man's food gathering and hunting stage of first development. First, the female is rendered sedimentary, even though before becoming a mother she may have been as mobile as any man or boy. Thus, her experience becomes limited to her domestic duties and she is confined to her home territory. She is a food gatherer, her husband is a hunter. Her task will be to gather plants and tuber, honey, grubs and the like. In short, whatever is edible and can be procured without hunting. Between caring for her children, food gathering, preparing meals, and performing other domestic activities, little time is left her for any other kind of experience. The male, on the other hand, while he may be quite highly domesticated, is nevertheless called upon to exercise his ingenuity very much more frequently and in a more varied manner than the female. As a consequence of his hunting activities, he acquires a great deal of the kind of, of experience which almost never fails to falls to the lot of the female. He learns to read tracks and signs of the presence of animals or men. He becomes something of a naturalist for it is important to him to be able to distinguish between what is edible and what is not. He learns a great deal 
about the habits and ways of animals and plants life, about the weather and about the rocks and other materials from which his implements will be made, and the numerous other details associated with the hunting economy. Oh, that's out there. That's out there. Oh, he got that. There. Yo, why you throwing it that hot? Yo, Deshaun going through some things, yo. Deshaun going through some things, man. What's up, Deshaun? Come on, man. Get it together, bro. Come on, dude. Come on, man. Hope he's not a woman. So I had to say it, man. Come on now. So I had to say it. Come on. Come on. So I had to say it. If it is a woman, man, don't worry so much. Just say that hi and you love her. Just show her you love her, man. You know, man. Y'all gonna read so much into that. Have fun with it. Because he's a, hun he's a hunter, he knows best what what implement serves him most eff effectively in the hunt and it is he who is the inventor and maker of hunting implements he develops skills in the use of hunting and necessary and, and accessory implements and he transfers his skill to the making of articles of domestic use when he has time he may decorate them with designs of magical and religious significance out of these occupations in later stages of cultural development, such designs may be elaborated and put into non-objective into non-objective abstract forms or into purely representative forms. Though men may have given rise to the growth of art in this in in this way. It cannot be doubted that the way pottery, decoration, and weaving, and later basket making are concerned, women make their own contributions. But at the food gathering lower hunter, hunter stage of development, it does not appear that they do. Women, it seems, are far too occupied with their domestic duties. And furthermore, in many cultures, they are, they are actively discouraged from engaging in activities which are considered the exclusive prerogative of males, just as males are excluded from engaging in activities which are considered the exclusive pre preserve of females. We see then that the division of labor between the sexes has its origin in the biologically determined different functions of male and female. This does not mean that the male is biologically the more active one or that he is biologically determined to be a hunter. It does mean that these roles are the social consequences of the biologically determined reproductive differences between the sexes. It is an error to assume that the female is by nature sedimentary where the male is by nature active and mobile. Such activity differences do exist between male and female, but to a large extent there will seem to be secondary differences, not primary. That was an awesome video. I got a piece of come say that again. I'm sorry.
so glad they showed that this ad. Because fucking Papa John's trying to show that they are all into the ethnic movement, into the ethnic thing, you know what I mean? So it's awesome. They're trying to show that they actually. I, I'm not denying that you, you have a lot of. You have a lot of franchises, franchise owners that are minorities. I ain't denied that, you know what I mean? But y'all had to really pick them. Y'all had to really search for them, you know what I mean? All them people that was probably seeing them ass, they were probably like needle, needles, in, needles in the multiple haystacks. When in the heart of Texas. that the division of labor between the sexes has its origin in the biologically determined different functions of male and female. This does not mean that the male is biologically the more active one or that he is biologically determined to be a hunter. It does mean that these roles are the social consequences of the biologically determined reproductive differences between the sexes. It is an error to assume that the female is by nature sedimentary, whereas the male is by nature active and mobile. Such activity differences do exist between male and female, but to a large extent there will seem to be secondary differences and not primary differences. Let's go defense. Males have a higher metabolic rate than females, and even at quite early ages, males are more active than females. But the socially observed, di the socially observed difference in activity between the sexes, it cannot be doubted uh, to a large extent, acquired rather than inherited. In short, Man up in there. In short, these activity differences do not represent first nature, though they may become second nature. First nature is the biological equipment of potent potentialities with which one is born. Second nature is what one's culture and society makes of one, the habits which one acquires. Culture is the way of life of a people, its institutions, parts, and pants. The division of labor between the sexes is a cultural expression of biological differences. The variety of culture, the variety of cultural forms which, which this expression may take in different societies is enormous. What may be considered women's work in one May, may be deemed men's work in another. In some cultures, men and women may engage in common activities, which in other cultures are strictly separated along sexual lines. The important point to grasp is that the prescribed roles assigned to the sexes are not determined biologically, but largely culturally, as Professor Ralph Linton has put it.
Our society prescribes different attitudes and activities to men and to women. Most of them try to rationalize these prescriptions in terms of the, psycho of, of the physiological differences between the sexes or their different roles in the reproduction. However, a comparative study of the statuses ascribed to women and men in different cultures seems to show that while such factors may have served as a starting point for the development of a, div of a division, the actual ascriptions are almost entirely determined by culture. And that was based from Ralph Linton's The Study of Men, published by D. Appleton's Century Company in 1936 on page 160. The biological differences between the sexes obviously provide the grounds upon which are based the different social roles which the sexes are expected to play. But the significance of the biological difference is often interpreted in such a manner as to convey the appearance of a natural connection between con conditions which are in fact only artificially connected, that is by mis misinterpretation. For example, in almost all cultures, pregnancy, birth and nursing are interpreted by both sexes as handicapping experiences. As a consequence, women have been made to feel that by virtue of their biological functions, they have been biologically, naturally placed in an inferior position to men. But as we, as we are today well know, as we, to, as we today well know, these biological functions of women are only minimally, if at all, handicapping. It is worth paying some attention to the significance of the fact that in the one role in which one would have thought it all too obviously clear that women were the superior of men, namely in their ability to bear and bring up children, women have been made to feel that their roles are handicapping ones. The evidence relating to the conditions of childbirth and, ch and child rearing in non literal in in non-literate societies is scant enough, but the indications are that on the whole women are in women in non-literate societies, namely third world countries, you know what I mean, seem to have a far easier time than they do in more complex ones. Unquestionably, under primitive conditions, childbirth and child rearing are to some ex extent handicapping conditions from the male point of viewpoint. This is this is the conscious male viewpoint. The unconscious male viewpoint there is much factual evidence to show is of a very different nature. We shall consider this aspect of the matter when we come to it. In almost all societies, birth seems to have been culturally converted into a very much more complex, difficult and handicapping process than it, it in fact is. In general, it would seem that the more complex a society becomes, the more it tends to complicate the process of birth. One result of this complication is seen in the cultures of the Western world, where women have been made to spend anything from 10 days to three weeks in, quote, confinement, close quote, as the state so appropriately used to be called. With the advent of, quote, natural birth, Women are finding childbirth far from unpleasant and far from handicapping. Ambulatory surgery has influenced obstetrics to such an extent that the mother who has given birth is required to rise within two days of delivery of her child and within four or five days to return to her home. In some non-literate societies, some women take much less time than that to return to their natural household chores. In in food gathering cultures such as those of the Bushmen of South Africa and the Australian Aborigine, the fact that a woman is pregnant or that 
an hour an hour ago she gave birth to a child is generally responsible for no deviation whatever from her customary manner of living except for the additional task of nursing it sometimes happens that on the march in wandering from one food area to another a woman falls out gives birth to her child catches up with her companions and behaves very much as if nothing extraordinary had happened what hey i have seen a skit of a joke about that somewhere i can't remember where it's something though but that is wow that is some great what Another child happens to be born to her a little too soon after the last one, it may be disposed of. For now, it may constitute a real disability, since under the conditions of food gathering existence, it is difficult to take care of more than one infant at a time. There must be adequate spacing between children, not alone for this reason, but also because the business of raising a child is considered to be virtually a full-time job and a matter not to be undertaken too lightly. Childbirth and nursing do introduce additional activities into the life of the female, but such activities do not necessarily constitute disadvantages. In comparison with certain forms of masculine mobility and under certain social conditions, such activities may be disadvantages and it would be wrong to underestimate them. It would however be equally wrong to overestimate their dis those disadvantages. Yet this has been done and I believe the evidence strongly indicates that it has been deliberately, if to some extent unconsciously done. If one can turn childbirth into a handicapping function, then that makes women so much more inferior to the sex which suffers from no such handicap. Persons who resort to such devices are usually not so much concerned with the inferiorities of others as with their own superiority. Now, if one happens to be lacking in certain capacities with which the opposite sex is naturally endowed, then those capacities happen to be highly if unacknowledgeably valued then one can compensate for one's own deficiency by devaluing the capacities of others by turning capacities into handicaps one can not only make their prof their possessors feel inferior but anyone lacking those capacities can then feel superior by very lack of them for very lack of them Men have been jealous of women's ability to give birth to children and they have been very jealous of their ability to menstruate, but men have not been content with turning these capacities into disabilities, for they have surrounded the ones with handicapping rituals and the ones with taboos, which, is in, which in most cases amount to punishment. They have even gone so far as to assert that pregnancy occurs in the male first, that it is entirely dependent upon him whether the female becomes pregnant or not. For instance, among numerous Australian tribes, okay, listener and listener discretion is advised here. These are not my words. I'm reading a book titled The Natural Superiority of Women by Ashley Montague, written in 1962 or 1952, one of the two, but yes. I'm reading from a book, so 
These are not my views now, but it's an interesting ass piece. Men have been jealous of women's abilities to give birth. See, the reason why I just said that about all that, because like 10 minutes ago, like I beat my tongue when I was about to say something. Now when I got to like childbirth and nursing, do introduce additional activities. Like I beat my tongue in that part, but I just kept reading it, but I was thinking about it in my head like, why did I bite my tongue right there? I mean, was it just because I was happening? But, but the God believing, fearing human in me has to take into consideration that, yes, there, there is a possible chance that just maybe, just maybe, what I might be saying here might be something that I should be saying in the sense where my tongue should be bitten. But I'm lending voice to thought, so fuck it. Got a video, we didn't vote. Please go vote. Please go vote. Like, please go vote. I can't vote. Like, if you ask me right now if I ever vote, I'm going to tell you. Now, I'm going to tell you because in the past, people might be like, like this guy I walked with, I named Rocky. And you know how you hear somebody names so and you haven't met them yet? And then you meet them and the name doesn't fit the look and build of the person? That was Rocky. But yeah. Little prick. What's up, right? But yeah, though, long story short, though, like, I, when I have, have had arguments and discussions with people and shit, talk about just voting and all that, and the whole benefits of it and the importance of it, people always be like, where did you go, bro? I say, yeah, I tell you, for the sake of that, those arguments that I've had then, in some situations, I've admitted that I can't vote, you know what I mean? But at the same time, though, I'm just saying, you can, if you can, just go do it, yo. It don't cost you none, especially if you ain't got nothing to do. You know what I mean? Look at it this way. That one check you get a month, or that one check you get every two weeks, whether you get 12 checks a year or 26 or 27 checks a year, just take that one day and go vote, y'all. Just please, you know what I mean? And I can't tell you who to vote for, but I can tell you don't vote for the Republican Party. It doesn't matter what they're about. Right now, like right now for the next 50 years, yo, it doesn't matter what they're about. I'm just saying, if you ever vote in any election moving forward, because put it this way, right? If we spend the next three, four, five, six, seven years right now voting straight on the Democratic ticket, straight on the Democratic ticket, Within that time, we will have enough people in our minority urban communities that we can put in place to, to introduce legislations and laws that can improve the livelihoods of our communities, that can make sure that we have some things, things like rent control. So a one-bedroom apartment will be, will be controlled at like maybe $875. They can afford to do it like that. I'm just saying. Or maybe even nine nine fifty. I'm just saying, you know what I mean. But just not like twelve. 30, I mean, just you can't. It's a money thing. If you pay rent, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. Like my man Dell said, at the first of the month, the rent is due. What up, D? He said, in addition to that, he said, man, try to tell you, man, that's like maybe the fifth or sixth smartest black man that I've really met in the United States that I've had conversations with. And the first one, the first one in Los Angeles, you know what I mean? I can't say the only one in Los Angeles because I, 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 I'm like, yeah, guy to know some other folks out here, but it's harder to meet woke brothers out here. It's a lot of woke sisters, so it's a lot harder not to count the non-woke sisters than it is not to count the woke sisters. You know what I mean? It, 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 see, if that, it, see if that makes sense. But a long story short, though, just like just go vote, man. Like that shit matters. With that type of with that type of activity, and we're doing it on a consistent basis, you can literally make sure there's certain shit that happens to you. So your community park will not will not be dark as as seven o'clock at night. So women can be attacked or children cannot i mean i'm just saying just y'all know what i'm getting at man i'm i i can't even find the words how to break it down because 
it's been hopped on for so long for, for by so many people forever you know what i mean black white brown alike i'm just saying but i digress the dodgers try to make a comeback in the eighth they're only down by one for a team that got rocked for five opening so to open up at the game they're doing just fine Come on, Houston. Hold that lead, man. I need Dallas to lose, man. If them dumbass Redskins had a loss to the coach, a game y'all overestimated yourselves. Would have been 3 0 in the division coming off our bye, but it's all good, though. We're still 2 1. I ain't mad at y'all. Number one defense in the league. I ain't mad at y'all. He good. He good. He good. My oh, man, good. That thing went like seven extra yards. He could have kicked it 55 yards. Men have been jealous of women's ability to give birth to children and they have even been jealous of the ability to menstruate. But men have not been concerned with turning their, ca their capacities into disabilities for they have surrounded the one with, with handicapping rituals and the, and the other with taboos which in most cases amount to punishment. They have even gone so far as to assert their pregnancy occurs in the male force and that it is entirely dependent upon him whether the female becomes pregnant or not. For instance, among numerous Australian tribes, it is a common belief that intercourse has no causative relation to the pregnancy, to pregnancy, and that pregnancy is caused by the entry of a spirit child into the female. I told ya, Listener discretion is advice. In many of these tribes, it is the husband who first dreams that a spirit child has entered him should he desire a child. He tells his wife what has happened and the spirit child is then transferred to her. Even then, she is merely regarded as the incubator of the child planted in her by the male. So, as for menstruation, it is regarded as a woman's method of getting rid of the evil humors which accumulate within her body. Yo, they sound just like white rednecks, yo. They write textbooks and shit. They are published textbooks. Since men have no such nat natural means of achieving this described end, this desired end, the Australian Aborigines perform an operation on the adolescent youth at his second initiation which is called sub sub incision this operation consists of slitting open the urinary tube the urethra on the underside of the penis from the scrotum to the external orifice a stone is then inserted into the sub incised penis to keep the urethra permanently open. Such a sub, sub incised penis is then by the same name, it is, it is called by the same name as that of the female vulva. There can, there can be not the least doubt that it represents an attempt to imitate the female external genitals. 
every so often, especially as ceremonies and initiations, the sub incised penis will be incised to make it bleed in, in, in imitation of the female's menstruation. Yo, they should do that to rapists, yo. If you if you convicted of rape, they should go do that to you. Go split open your urethra and insert a stone. It's like, now let me stop. Precisely similar operations are performed by the natives of the island of Wojio, one of the Sosten Islands of the north coast of Netherlands, New Guinea. Periodic incision of the penis and the flow of blood thus induced is often referred to as men's menstruation. Such men are subjects, that's what Trump goes to whenever he, his ass tweets. He be having his, his little daily men's period and shit, PMSing and shit. That dumbass. What's up, dummy dumb truck? I haven't invoked your name in a little while. Namely, like 45 minutes. I'm sorry. I didn't forget about you. There's plenty more where that came from. Such men are subject to much the same prohibitions as menstruating women, but the flow of blood is considered to be a necessary cleansing process. What the female possesses by natural endowment, the male must, at great pain and suffering to himself, periodically produce by art. This is a further ground of jealousy and resentment against the female. A similar operation is therefore performed upon girls at puberty. He got that, he got that, he got that. What an arm. What an arm. I'm sorry, Dodger fans, but I want Dave Roberts to win the World Series more than I want the team to win it. But since he's a manager, so I want the team to win it. You know what I mean? Y'all going up against the Yankees. I told y'all that. But still, though, I don't have a horse in this race. But I have jumped on a horse because Dave Roberts is the manager. It's been what, since 73? Since a black manager won a World Series? Safe. Safe. Got that. Got that. Safe. Got that. That was like a split second, yo. I don't even think it was a split nanosecond. What's more than a nanosecond? A similar operation is therefore performed upon girls at puberty. During this operation, the clitoris and both labia are cut away, at which time in one Australian group, all the initiated men proceed to have intercourse with the girl. Such an operation is performed in the thousands at the present time in the territories of Egypt and far up along both sides of the Nile. Furthermore, in the North African regions where this operation is performed, the vulva is sewn up in such a manner as to leave only a small orifice for the exudation of the menstrual and urinal fluids. This operation is known as infibulation. Here, the jealousy of the male has gone so far as to limit virtu virtually completely the female's capacity for pregnancy and childbirth. When the girl reaches marriageable age, the orifice may be enlarged to admit her husband's penis, and it will be opened up. 
by incision shortly before childbirth and after childbirth sewn up again. That was from Woman, a book written by H H Plus P L O S S and M and P Bartels B A R T E L S. It was published by V Mosby Company in 1935 in St. Louis, Missouri. Part one, page 353 to 363. What a title! Just woman. And reign in 1935. Yeah, that's probably one of them big ass, thick ass books. I can't say it's not really, but it would be interesting to have a copy of it laying around. I digress, so I'm sorry, people. To prevent any really thinking that it is only non literate. To so prevent any really thinking that it is only non literate people and benighted hidden who divulge in such sadistic exercises at the expense of the female, it has only to be pointed out that not so many years ago, some American surgeons were performing clitoridectomies by the dozens, while today surgeons are yearly sedulously castrating thousands of women for what is called the operation of hysterectomy really is. Yeah, this is for them, them people that's been thinking, why is he talking to Americans about awful, nasty shit that happened in, in other nations? Forgive me, America is not excluded from shit like this, okay? I'm sorry. No nation is, not even my nation above. Men and men, wherever the fuck you go. We're all the same, yo. Poopy heads. They going no overtime. They going no overtime. They going no overtime. They going no overtime. They going no overtime tonight. They're going on overtime tonight. They're going on overtime. Unless oh, they sound engineer a two minute drill. What you think, Dabo? You got it? Colin Cowhead is one of my favorite white boys, yo. That white boy keeps it real like shit. That white boy keeps it real like shit. <laughs> 